Okay, so Mary, welcome to TESS 2020 online. Thank uh, you. One, of the, one of the perks of hosting this event virtually is that you are able to join us all the way from beautiful Victoria, BC. Um, we think of BC Campus here at eCampus Ontario kind of like a sister organization that's doing similar work on the West Coast in terms of facilitating innovation in the post-secondary system. And Mary, you've been at the helm as executive director there since 2014. So for those of you that are tuning in today, Mary will be discussing one of BC Campus's new initiatives spurred by the year's sudden transition to remote teaching, as well as just this idea of how we can connect and, and humanize our interactions with colleagues and learners during a crisis. Uh, so Mary, I'm just going to jump right in here, if you don't mind. Um, I want to talk a bit about how the work of BC Campus has shifted since the transition to remote learning. Mm -hmm. um, I know that you have been working with the ministry on a project related to wellness and mental health for the post-secondary sector. Can you share a little bit about that with us? Absolutely. It's been, uh, it's been quite a ride out here, just like everywhere else. Um, and so really early on in the pandemic, our Ministry of Advanced Education recognized that it was going to be a really stressful time for people in our sector and that that would have a negative impact on people's ability to learn and teach and do their jobs and all sorts of things like that. So they asked BC Campus to pull together a project that would focus on mental health um, and physical health actually, as it's turned out in addition. Um, and so what we did was put together an advisory group of um, student service leaders from our institutions, as well as student, uh, student government reps, student federation reps. So they are really the group that tells us what they need and what the system needs. Um, and then we've also worked with a consultant who has helped us to um, find subject matter experts and really sort of validate the work of the advisory group as an expert in that, in that area. And that's resulted in us doing a whole uh, variety of webinars for the most part. Um, everything from how to manage your own physical well-being, your mental well-being, things like breathing exercises, um, ways to eat differently to help yourself, um, and even things like how to um, develop a better relationship as a grad student with your supervisor. Just a really huge um, variety of things that would help folks in the sector. And in addition to that, we have a website um, that has recordings from all of those sessions, as well as a bunch of other resources, including pointing out to the institutions who have some really amazing content um, for students across the whole sector as well. So, so that's what we've been working, one of the many things we've been working on uh, as a shift in the pandemic. Wow, that's great. So are these webinars and these resources publicly available? They are, yeah. So they're all on our website. Um, we record most of the webinars that we do. Sometimes it's not appropriate given the subject matter or who we're talking to. So we don't in those cases, but for the most part, everything that we do is uh, recorded or however else made available and almost always uh, licensed with uh, Creative Commons licensing so others can use it how that works for them. Wow, that's great. So I'm, I'm really curious about uh, what challenges staff and students have been sharing with you through these webinars and through these discussions. Yeah, I think um, it's been really interesting and I've been um, lucky to be at a bunch of different tables to sort of find out what's happening. Um, everything from I follow a whole bunch of institutional subreddits so that I can find out what our students saying about their experience, um, both good and bad, and, and through that and, and these working committees, etc. that we have, um, it's really been helpful to kind of learn about sort of the deep fear, the discomfort with the ambiguity of the situation, um, but also see things like, you know, today I read of an instructor who paid a student's internet bill so that she could participate in a Zoom session. So from the student perspective, we're seeing a real wide variety of experiences, everything from I don't think I can do this, I'm going to need to drop a course, it's too much of a load when I'm online, to some really amazing experiences where educators have really stepped up to create situations that are um, much more doable for students, but still maintain the rigor that needs to be done in order to do the learning. And from faculty, it's been so interesting, again, to see the transition as we've gone through from the beginning of the pandemic 
where it was just felt like chaos, I think, for everybody. Um, and there was a lot of fear, I think, really, um, fear for educators that they didn't know what to do, that they didn't know how to connect with their students. We know a huge percentage of educators had never taught online before. So really early on, what we saw from people was as much as they were looking for sort of the tips and tricks about what tools to use online and, and how, to, how to teach online, but also just people looking for community um, because they were afraid um, and, and really feeling a lot of discomfort around that. And so um, we were able to kind of connect people with each other and with people who could help um, in that space. And we've seen such a shift um, now, just uh, yesterday, I, I was able to meet with uh, all the vice presidents academic in our system, um, along with our ministry and hear from them that things are actually going better than they thought they would. Um, and a lot of that is down to the amount of preparation that happened um, over the summer, um, both by educators as well as folks in our teaching and learning centers and IT services units in the institutions. That's great. Um, what do you think is is causing things to go better now? Is it just the amount of preparation? Is it that people are emotionally prepared as well this time around? I think definitely the amount of preparation played a huge role. Um, we're pretty connected to the teaching and learning centers at BC campus and many of us come from that world. And so we've been hearing about, you know, the number of hours that they're putting in to help um, faculty not just develop their courses for online and, and pivot the, the teaching materials, but teaching them how to actually teach online. And so I, I do think that a lot of it has been preparation. And I think it's also sort of um, coming to terms with the fact that this is the way it's going to be. Um, and it's going to be this way for a while. And so seeing some return. So we do have some um, trades programs, for example, having students come to campus in socially distant ways. Um, but, but really, I think it's um, that people are just deciding they've got to get on with it because this is the way that it's going to be now. Do you think that um, having staff and educators have the chance to hear about students' perspectives and vice versa has contributed to any kind of a, a stronger understanding between these two cultures that can sometimes be a little bit different? Yeah, absolutely, I would say so. I think, um, again, it's that it's it's humanized everybody, I think, right? There has been such vulnerability in this entire situation for everyone. And I think it's one of those things in the same way that it's accelerated the use of online learning. It's also sort of accelerated um, what I want to call like emotional development of people um, in terms of holding space for each other and um, and understanding that it's okay to not be okay and that there will be people there to help you um, and that it's a good idea to ask for help. And so I think that, um, again, some of the things I've seen between educators and their students, that humanizing element, um, I think has really, uh, really developed those relationships more quickly and in more meaningful ways than they otherwise would have. I really hope that kind of sticks around that that becomes the new normal in terms of um, relationships between educators and students. I heard you use um, the term a lens of caring in a previous discussion we were having and I think that just speaks so well to what everyone's going through and, and what people really need to be doing going forward not just like now during this pandemic but probably going forward for the next foreseeable future. Absolutely. I think, you know, I've been doing work sort of in the area of compassion and things like that for a number of years, just as a sort of a healing journey of my own. And to sort of see that um, coming to light across our system and um, some of the work that we've done at BC campus in the past has been around care and education. We did a um, a conference a couple of years ago for our festival of learning where the, the, the theme of the conference was about care in our post-secondary system and how we uh, really put that into the way we interact with students right from the beginning stages of their experience with applying for school even right through to how we value alumni and I think that 
that journey of seeing people um, as as whole people and people being able to bring their whole selves and um, the relationship between educators and students becoming much more reciprocal and yeah and humanizing again um, and I think it also is really helpful in terms of shifting the way we view how learning works because for so many years and in so many disciplines we still see sort of that um, sage on the stage model where what, as we pivot to online, we're sort of democratizing the way that education happens and developing very different relationships that value um, much more what students already know and their lived experiences in the educational setting that just really helps, I think, um, helps people learn better and have a better learning experience, which then will lead to, you know, all of the good things that we want to see in education around more enrollments and more persistence in programs and completing programs and, um, and going on in life and being lifelong learners. So, um, so yeah, I, it's very, very hopeful, I think. Mary, I'm wondering about some of the prior projects that BC Campus has been involved with, and I'm wondering how some of those, those prior initiatives prepared you for this really rapid shift in online connection and online learning and, and remote learning. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's sort of a bunch that come at it from different angles. So at BC Campus, we have a unit we call Collaborative Projects, and that's where we sort of house our, um, our semi-weird offshoot projects that we end up doing on behalf of government that all somehow link back to the post-secondary sector, but may not be as tightly tied to teaching and learning as our core mandate work is. And a couple of those that have come up over the last uh, two years, one is uh, around sexualized violence and misconduct. And that again was a project that really had us working closely with students. Um, and that I think uh, was really helpful for sort of having a foundation of relationships with students already. Um, so, so that one, um, as well as kind of it being in the realm of care um, so I think that was really helpful. Um, in addition to the mental wellness project, we also had been doing a project for about a year prior to that, that was another mental health project that was more broad in the system. Um, but again, we'd sort of already started making those connections with people um, through that project. And so, so those, those two projects, I think, were really helpful from that perspective. The other one I think that's been the biggest help for this is our open education work. And so, and especially right now, I mean, we could not have been better positioned to support this pandemic at BC campus because we've been doing that work um, in open education across our sector for so many years that has required collaboration, not just between us and institutions, but institutions between each other. Um, and so those relationships, I think, and that notion of collaboration was really already um, in place. And that's been one of the things I think that's really contributed to our success and our ability to, um, to make things happen over the years is that continual building of collaborative relationships between institutions. Um, and the other thing about that work, I think, is that it has been... Um, we've tried to be pedagogically focused with the development of open educational resources. And so again, that's meant that the people that we've brought in to work with us as um, we seconded um, staff from the institutions to come and work on our projects. And as I said, many of those people have come either from teaching and learning centers or their faculty who uh, are in love with pedagogy and, uh, and practice. And so we have got the largest number of those types of people with that skill set than, than we've ever had at BC campus. Um, and so it really allowed us to very quickly shift and within about a week and a half start doing webinars on how to do online learning. Um, and, and so I, those pieces, I think, were so crucial for us to be able to really quickly make that shift. I mean, literally, it was, I saw a post, I think, from Daniel Williamson at OpenStack saying, we're hosting a session. 
um, for educators, I posted something in our team's thing saying, should we do this? And a week later, we were offering webinars because our people are just like, yes, absolutely, we should be doing that. And they just jumped on the chance to uh, really be of service in that space. And so I think all of those pieces really, um, as well as the relationships that we have had, because we worked with that person in the teaching and learning center because that's where we came from. And so having those connections and being able to really know what was happening in institutions and therefore what they needed really quickly, I think was so crucial to our, our ability to really hit the ground running and know what needed to be offered and, and how to offer it right away. So I think a real package of things is, is what was helpful for us. What about your team itself? I know that you work remotely a fair bit as it is, but I mean, this is kind of a whole new ball of wax. How do, how do you guys stay connected? Yeah. So far apart? We have a whole bunch of things that we do. So you're right. We already did have a work from home culture at BC campus um, in part because we're spread all over the province. So it really has never been possible for us to all be in the same office. We do have an office in Vancouver and one in Victoria and um, it, the Victoria one, we do have a number of staff who were coming and working in that office. Some people five days a week, other people, we sort of did a year in Tuesday, Thursday, year in Wednesday, Friday, et cetera, because we don't have an, enough space. Um, and also we want to support that flexible um, workplace culture that is really helpful for, you know, across the board. We've got people who are still in university to people with little children, to people caring for aging parents and providing that flexibility um, in order to work from home has been, um, has been really helpful, I think, and allowed us again to just sort of go, we're all just going home. Um, some people who didn't work at home as much needed to, you know, get kitted out with desks and things like that. So we helped them do that. Um, but yeah, we already all were doing Zoom and Teams and Blue Jeans and all of those tools and, um, and accustomed to working that way. So we sort of already had that. We did do a bunch of, of um, things that uh, to sort of to stay connected with each other. And I was saying to my husband last night, I kind of can't believe some of the stuff now, because in the first about 10 weeks of the pandemic, we had a mini version of the Great British Baking Show at BC campus. Oh, so it's like, I, now I feel like I don't even know how we managed to, to pull that off. But one of our staff um, is a huge baker. A number of our staffs are, are really big into baking. And, um, and it actually worked with one of the people um, who was on the Great Canadian Baking Show, Jude Summers, who uh, he, this staff member, Dave Shakowicz, and I both know because we worked with Jude at UVic millions of years ago. And so we asked Jude to come and be a judge for us. And so she would get online with us and one of the other um, baking people, James, who is an instructor at Kwantlen Polytechnic. And we would all bring our baking stuff and show it off and have our families come and taste it. And so that whole experience, I think, was just a really good opening way for us to stay connected with each other, as well as meet each other's families, see each other's kitchens, all of those kinds of things. I think that that was really helpful. So that was one thing. Like I said, I, I kind of can't believe I baked everything <laughs> now. I'm like, that is super not happening anymore. Uh, we also did a couple of, you know, people just coming forward and saying, we want to host an online game session. And so we all got online together and played trivia and things like that. Um, we continued to do some of the things that we were already doing. So um, since about January, actually, um, coincidentally, I had been doing a regular Wednesday morning meditation session for anybody who wanted to join me. And I was doing it online because I wanted everybody to be able to join. So I just play a, um, a session from the Calm app. Everybody turns off their mics and cameras and we listen and meditate together and that's it. 10 minutes Wednesday mornings. And so we continued to do that and, uh, and, and have, I've had more people joining again because we're looking to, um, to support ourselves and each other. 
We also um, now do uh, what I call anarchy slash co-working hour. And it's an hour once a week where we get together and we just uh, are all sort of working on heads down focused work for that hour. I play a gong at the beginning and I play a gong at 25 minutes. We sort of do the Pomodoro technique thing. We take a break at five minutes, everybody stretches. We come back and do another 25 minutes. At the beginning, some of us say, I'm gonna work on whatever. And at the end, some people say, this is how it went. But again, it's just sort of kind of making up for the fact that we can't pop into each other's office and say, hey, what are you doing? What are you working on? And so, again, that's been a thing that has sort of allowed us to stay connected to each other as humans, as well as to, to the work that we're doing, because we're not able to sort of walk past someone's desk and hear that they're having a conversation about something that actually might be helpful for us to be a part of. So, um, so that, uh, we have also done a couple of um, Indigenous uh, projects. So we did uh, an Indigenous art retreat back in June. So we had everybody at BC campus go out and find uh, their favorite or a favorite Indigenous artist learn a little bit about that person. And then we all got together in Zoom and each took turns talking about our artist and showing pictures of them and talking about what we liked about them. Um, that was another piece. And then uh, we also did an indigenization book club. So again, just another way uh, to get together and be online. And, um, and, and I, I want to say again, just how impactful it's been to be in each other's houses. I think that has been so critical. I know more people's kids, husbands than I ever would have had we not been working this way. So for me, especially as an introvert, it's been amazing. <laughs> Yeah, there is something very, very humanizing about seeing people in their day-to-day -day space and like seeing people's cats walk into the frame and seeing people like cooking in the background and those things. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, I have to say that uh, the British Bake Off thing is something we haven't tried at Ecampus Ontario, but maybe I'll slip that into the group chat next week and we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I made an amazing rainbow cake. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit more about the book club with Indigenous authors? That sounds really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So again, that's something that we had started um, before we went uh, away on the pandemic. And the first book that we did um, was the Tom King uh, book that I'm going to forget the name of now. Um, it's uh, Massey Lectures that he did. Okay. Um, and so, so that was the first one that we did. Um, we also have worked through uh, at BC campus, we did a project a few years ago that produced some indigenization guides um, for uh, foundations, leaders, curriculum developers, instructors, etc. And so we went through the foundations guide as one of our um, book clubs and uh, I can't remember what the, we're about to start another book club that's a book of poetry again I'm, I hate that I can't remember. Maybe we can pass that around somehow. Um, but yeah, just another way for us to come at that. And, and, and again, another way for us to come at the, the decolonization work that we're trying to do, right? So um, yesterday we had, we actually had a retreat yesterday all online again. And the, the final hour, we had some amazing folks come from the uh, residential school center at UBC. Um, and do a session with us. And, um, and so we have things like that, that we do where we learn about, um, you know, the, the terrible history and the impact of that. But then we also want to see the resilience and the joy and, and the, uh, and the art and the culture. And so having the book club pieces as a way to sort of shore that up as well, um, to see, uh, I think it's so important to see resilience um, and to see, um, the future and uh, and the and the amazing things that Indigenous people have been able to do, and mm -hmm. so by kind of balancing looking at things like residential schools with art and culture, um, it really helps us create a, a more full picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like a very holistic approach. I remember something else you said when we were talking. You were saying that you thought sometimes that doing things digitally with your team was uh, a real advantage because there was tools that were at your disposal that like weren't really even at your disposal when you were totally I guess totally in the same room does that 
I'm trying to think what that would have been. Um, I mean, we definitely are seeing, I think, I think for us, it's kind of, it's just lay, leveled the playing field, right? Like, especially for introverts, it has leveled the playing field and, and enabled us to be part of things mm-hmm. that we haven't been able to be part of because of social anxiety or whatever the problem is. Yeah. And for example, for me, I haven't traveled for work hardly at all the last couple of years because it gives me terrible anxiety. Mm-hmm. Now nobody's traveling for work. So <laughs> I'm seeing the people that I wasn't able to see because they were meeting face to face. Now I'm able to see them all again because they're not meeting face to face, they're meeting online. Do you think there are actual advantages to working remotely that maybe aren't available at all to teams when they're they're forced to be in the office more? I think there definitely are advantages to being uh, to not being synchronously together necessarily or or just together uh, full stop. And I think those are, there's, there are some things that come down to technologies that are available to us to do things online um, that are more difficult to do, um, say, in a face-to-face setting. But for me, I think it's really, a lot of it is about um, how, people, how people feel when they're with other people and how people feel when they can be in their own space. And so one of the things that we've seen at BC Campus and, and across the system is, it's a hard time for extroverts right now. And the people who really get uh, energized by being with other people are struggling. And on the other hand, those of us who are more introverted are kind of thriving in this space. And I would say, I mean, just even personally, what I'm noticing about myself is not having to uh, sort of confront anxiety on a daily basis about having to leave a space that feels um, more safe for me has made me, um, I'm having way bigger ideas and better ideas than I've ever had. Um, and I do think that that a big part of that is that I'm not dealing with anxiety nearly as frequently as I normally would be. Um, it's also, I think, from the perspective of students, I mean, we've known for a long time in online learning, for example, that an online discussion forum is an awesome place for an introvert to say what they think, because they don't have any of the pressure of seeing other people's reactions while they're writing, responding to that, fearing reaction, all of those kinds of things. They have time to think something through and write a really um, a really awesome response to something that's clear and that are things that they would never say if they were in a face-to-face setting that they would just quietly keep to themselves and not, not be such a contributor to the, the learning community. And so there's definitely some, some pieces there. I just think, um, the introverts have, have um, it's sort of the meek will inherit the earth thing, right? It's sort of um, even down to things like I haven't traveled very much for work in the last couple of years because of anxiety. It's meant I've missed out on seeing people and being part of conversations. Um, and now because nobody can be together, everybody's together online and I'm back in those conversations again. Um, And that alone has been, uh, again, just really helpful for me. I also think, you know, if we think about um, one of the things that really drives my work is the notion of who are we leaving out? And when we force people to come to a particular location at a particular uh, time and behave in a particular way, we're leaving a lot of people out of that. If you're a single parent at home with a kid, if you are a person who has elderly parents that you're caring for, if you're a person who also has a job, all of those things are barriers to coming and sitting down in a lecture theater or a classroom or whatever at a certain time. And so the flexibility that distributed learning and just doing things online presents for people, I think really, um, it includes many more people. Now that said, obviously we have an opposite side to that, which is um, we've got people who can't afford the technology. We've got people who don't have a space of their own at home uh, where they can shut everything off and and be in a Zoom meeting that doesn't have children and others um, Mm -hmm. moving around the mom cooking behind them and those sorts of things. Um, And so I think we definitely have to do some work to account for that. and, And we are. 
Um, but I think overall, it does create a more equitable um, situation for a lot of students who haven't had that in the past. I think there's this really key idea too about the idea that when we do things remotely, whether it's learning or just connecting with colleagues, that we have to somehow do that and emulate face-to-face -face activities. But really, when we have more digital tools at our disposal, it's not just about emulating things, but it's about reimagining some things completely. And as you say, leveling the playing field. Right, yeah. It's so interesting because something I had not, it hadn't even occurred to me, but yesterday with the vice presidents, one of the things that they were talking about is that very early on, um, all of the institutions had to increase the amount of storage space because instructors were using video capture to tape themselves lecturing and loading those to servers, which takes up a whole bunch of space. Already, as someone who's not a huge fan of lecturing, the <laughs> idea of forcing students to sit in front of a computer and watch you talk when they're not even in the room to ask questions and you're not even doing it at the same time, that's not good for learning. And so absolutely, we want to think about the affordances of technology and what they can enable us to do and, uh, and, and how that can improve learning and how it can give us flexibility, both for the way people teach and the way people learn. Um, and so I think we really need to think carefully about not trying to recreate uh, a setting that maybe I've been really trying to think hard about the idea that we we maybe think things were okay the way they were, but they actually weren't. And so this has given us an opportunity to really look deeply at that, figure out the things that we value and keep those, but move away from some of the other ones. And technology really allows us to do that, I think, and, um, and, and think deeply about our lectures and um, gyms full of students writing exams, the way we wanna go forward with education or are there better ways of having relationships with students, having them have agency over their learning, all of those kinds of things that we can do when we don't just try to emulate the thing that we've been doing for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, so Mary, I just wanna close with kind of a final Point here. I'm wondering what your key takeaway has been about the importance of humanizing each other during this time. I think for me, who has been sort of um, using the notion of vulnerability, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan, um, using that notion of vulnerability and compassion, um, I, it gives me so much hope for the future of education not just post-secondary, but around the world, seeing, seeing each other as whole people. And I, I think for me, that is, um, that is the thing that we want to take with us from this, no matter how it ends up, no matter how we end up going back. Let's try to remember what it felt like to be vulnerable and connected to each other, um, because that is the world I want to live in, you know? Uh, and so I want people to keep behaving that way, and I want them to keep um, you know, holding space for each other and, and asking, what can I do for you? How can I help you? How can I uh, make this easier for you? And, um, and I just want to listen, right? Like, let's just connect. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I, I really hope that those are the things that we take with us out of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming here and sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Such a pleasure.